We'll go from here, okay? So there's, I, I have some little animations on this. This is the table of contents. This is the map for the evening. All right, we're going to start in the top left. You are there by the tea. And we're just going to go through a series of, uh, of well, timestamps, like a radically condensed SSU timeline. I'll tell you about that. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about CMAR, we'll talk about cults, we'll talk about uh, dead end jobs for eternity, marriage, the summit on how museum, trash pageants. Brady, you were at the trash pageant, weren't you? Okay. Uh, writing, designing, married art. We're going to bottom out at death. We're going to hit a void, low point, and it's going to be death. Okay. But we'll enter through the void. Uh, we're going to ask some existential questions about what happens to your art when you die. And we're gonna we're gonna end on rebirth. All right, that'll be uh, I think that'll be exciting. This is me and Shawnee from 2012 to 2016. There's the Shawnee bear. Do they still have the Shawnee bear? Yeah. There's me on graduation day uh, with my metaphorical bear pelt. Hopefully, you guys get bear pelts when you graduate. One one really good class for me was. Uh, creative process, and uh, I took that in 2013, and this was uh, this was kind of the, the foundation of my artistic experience. You know, uh, there was this guy there named Lane Riser. Okay, it's a little dark. Jason, is there any way that you can bring that so they can see that? Do, can you guys see that? Okay, you can see Lane. Yeah, yeah. There you go, Jason. You were doing it. That's pretty good. Thank you. All right, there's Lane Riser. He, he's uh, unfortunately deceased, but he used to teach creative process here at uh, Shawnee. And me and my, uh, my brother and these two other kids, June and, and Dominique, we took creative process together. Well, Dom didn't, but uh, Dom's, Dom's a creative guy. Anyway, this is Lane's art. Okay, so this was our teacher, and he collected all this river trash that was just uh, floating on the uh, on the Ohio River, right? Or, or had come to the edges, and he kind of assembled it into like this um, wind chime thing, right? And this was his art that he entered in the Southern Ohio Museum. Uh, here's some baby hands that he found in the Ohio River, right? And uh, he said this kind of represented the process. This is how this guy thought, right? This kind of represented the creative process, this chaos that happened, and then maybe you can loosely assemble it together, right? And what's more, generative than baby hands, you know? Here is my, uh, my creative process journal. We each got a journal, a composition notebook, and we did train and conscious journal exercises uh, every day as part of the class. And we did a lot of homework together. Me, my brother Dom in June, in Townhouse A4 uh, here on campus. And we kind of just got lost in doing that every, every Tuesday and Thursday night. That was the thing that we liked to do. Um, you know, maybe we didn't fit in as much with the athletics, and we didn't party, so we just made art together. That was that was the most interesting thing to us. Um, and so, when when Lane died and that class ended, we were like, man, we got to keep making art together. Uh, we got to keep like working on these prompts and exploring this this creativity thing because it's really fun. Um, and so there, there's us, we started this thing called CMAR. It's called Creative Minds of Rare. That, that was our uh, art and clothing collective. Uh, there's my brother and me and, and Tom and June. And uh, we just started making, having like mad art shows, right? Every, uh, every couple months or so, we'd have an art show, make a bunch of art for it. We'd sell clothes, we'd print and sell clothes. Um, we'd sell food and uh, that was just that was the only thing we knew how to do. We didn't we didn't uh, we didn't have a plan. We just wanted to show people our art and talk to other people about it, right? Um, to, to prolong this creative process thing, you know. One show we had was called Seymour Sucks, and uh, you see someone had spray painted Seymour Sucks underneath the bridge on that one spray paint part, and that kind of hurt our feelings. So we were like, man, we should, you know what? We do suck. We'll have a show about how we suck. And we just started painting the inside of uh, Wayne Stump's studio space, you know, with spray paint, Sharpies, and it was all training consciousness. So, you know, in training consciousness or automatic writing, 
pain you don't think about, you try not to think about when you're doing it. I mean, to a certain level, that's impossible, but you kind of let the unconscious take over and you just, you write and you write and you, you paint and whatever forms come to mind, you just start uh, going in on that. And it's, a, it's really cool if you hit the flow state and you can maintain that for uh, a couple hours or something. You know, you kind of get lost in it. You're not thinking too much about what you have to do tomorrow or, or if it's even fun or not. It just, it just is, you know? And, uh, oh wait. Okay, here, here's another one. We really wrote on every inch of it. There was like 14 footballs, two 14 footballs, and one in the front and one in the back. And uh, we, we filled every, every spot, you know, and just got lost in that for like a month. We, we spent maybe like $300 on spray paint and bought a bunch of those thick Sharpies. And the Sharpies on the uh, on the wall, the, the wall was textured, kind of like stucco. And when you, you know, when we'd uh, go with the Sharpies, eventually the tip would just completely like burn off. And then we'd break the Sharpies and uh, open them up. And there's kind of like a felt piece in there. And then we'd write on the wall with that, you know, and we just kept, uh, that was our thing. Like, we, what are we gonna do today? We're gonna go to Wayne Stump's gallery and we're just gonna paint on the walls. And that was really freeing, and we we call ourselves uh, Creative Minds of Rare. That was the name of the name of the collective. But then we got to thinking, because everybody would come and participate with us, like our friends. We were like, man, you guys should come do this uh, creativity thing. Like Noah, Noah would come and he paint something on the wall, and and Heather would come and she paint something on the wall. My wife it wasn't my wife at the time, but it's my wife now. And uh, we're like, man, Creative Minds of Rare. That's not very like. It's not really very inclusive, really. I mean, we're telling other people that they should make art with us, and uh, and yet creative minds are rare. So are are we the rarest ones? Or uh, so we we decided that creative minds are not rare. But then that, that kind of ruined our thing. So we're like, now what? Well, we have an idea. Okay, we we decided to start a cult. We were like, let's start a cult, and then everybody can do everything together all the time, right? Uh, but don't worry, it's a creative cult. So that makes it okay. Like people be like, the cult? Uh, that's kind of scary. And we're like, but it's a creative cult. Like, oh, okay. And that some that would make a connection for them, you know. There, there was the door. There's the the door that we opened, and uh, that Lane Lane opened that door in our brains. Okay, and we'd say the door is open. All right, and we wanted to open that door for other people. We wanted to open this door of creativity, you know. Um, that was kind of our mission. We didn't really know what that was. We didn't know what that was, but it was our ideal. You know, we had it set up and we were like, man, if we could just open the door for more people, maybe we could act, actually open a real physical door in space and time somewhere, you know? And uh, that was our mission, but we really, we were just making art. So we started, uh, we, when we started the call, we had a production ceremony. Wait, everybody go to Wayne's again. Okay, Wayne Stubbs. And uh, we put these posters there in the top left, all up and down Chill Coffee Street. And uh, uh, <laughs> we put them up on like the light post and stuff, and then we turn around and some lady would look at it and be mad and like crumble it up and throw it away. And uh, we got them all up and down Chill Coffee Street. Then the police called Wayne because his address was on there. And they were like, yeah, you, you guys can't put these up. For every, for every poster like this we find, we're gonna find you. Fine, but we're gonna find you guys. So you have to take them all down. And so then we went and took them all down. Uh, but a lot of people still came to the event. I mean, it was a, it was a happening event. And um, the police did not come to the event, unfortunately. Like, what if the police came and we could, you know, give them markers and they could participate with us? You know, and we'd be like, this is see, you guys are in it now. You know, but no police came. We thought later about having an all police event, like, you know and invite all the police in the Tri-County area and they could all do like crafts and stuff together. We're like, if anybody wants to, take, wants to take that idea and run, you should, you really should. But there was us at the, uh, at the first call seduction ceremony, same thing, everybody was doing train of consciousness stuff, they were getting lost in the process, you know? And we had a, uh, it, it was cool, it was cool. We put red cellophane. Red cellophane art is on the lights. That's what gives it that culty glow, you know? And um, startling in the middle of the night, but. Okay, the second thing we did was at the Southern Ohio Museum, we, we uh, were asking, what's the definition of art, okay? 
And uh, that was the goal for the night, just like maybe we could define what art is. And we didn't do that. But what we did do was we made a, got a bunch of trash together and we put it on three separate tables. And we had teams of maybe 30, 20 or 30, all assemble these like trash cultures and we gave each a group a prompt and we were like don't tell the other groups what we're what you're making because we want to see if they can guess even though it's just a loose collection of trash all right so one one group we gave uh one group we gave the prompt to wendy's like the wendy's franchise the other group we gave abraham lincoln and the third group we gave was uh was batman and those what are what they had to make out of trash and tape and blue sticks and uh, they actually, at the end, people came startlingly close to guessing what, what each other's stuff was. And there was this one kid there that just kept going like, whenever he had to guess, he just kept going, it's the fall of man. That's like after every other song. It's the fall of man. Uh, session five. I'm kind of skipping here because here, you guys don't want to see all of these, but. Session five, we uh, went down in the basement of the brewery, very, very creepy, culty, definitely haunted. And we had everybody do one single stroke on a canvas each. And so it was like a mass, it was like a mass collaboration. And literally collaboration as in everyone's hands did one thing or took one action. And then the next person behind them came and did one. The next person behind them came and did one. And uh, it was very strange how it worked out again, like, there was one that was definitely a crucifix, and there was another that was definitely a pentagram, and then there was other things in between that. So it was like the opposite ends of the spectrum in like good and evil, and it was it was freaky actually. It was not <clears throat> we wouldn't do that again. But there's there's everyone, okay? We're all everyone's just kind of chilling down there. Our guy uh, Cody Mitten he come play music, and we were just we were just trying to figure out what we were even doing. I mean, we didn't know. We were hoping every, other people would start to figure that out, you know? And then I got, I, I proposed to my wife, okay? And all the money that I didn't make from the cult, I meant that I, I needed to prepare for marriage, okay? And so there, there was the money. There's my getting on the train. I, I got a soul-crushing day job, okay? I got a soul crushing day job with my father, and if you, if any of you guys are interested in art, something I would definitely recommend is getting just like the worst, most degrading, uh, most dehumanizing day job, where it's like no one believes in you. Okay, this this would be helpful. This would be like a bracing thing, you know, and because uh, maybe you could transcend that pain and that like self doubt and stuff. But uh, when you're in it, you don't feel that way at all. Okay, because. The, the first thing, we were just like installing and uninstalling toilets in college dorm rooms. And uh, that was like that was like the first uh, month of the job. It was like assembling toilets with my college art degree. It was really cool. Uh, <laughs> there, there was, uh, there's my home office. I, I was just living in my father's like extra room. I had my home office there. NickSherman.com was born right there though. Uh, just at that little ottoman that's not a desk, okay? And uh, yeah, that, that was the home office. My, my dad and uh, Frank there, they're like uh, fabricating these countertops. We go put countertops in all these places. This is art, but this is art. This is part of the progression. What's more symbolic of, of uh, uh, never escaping a soul pressure day job than just like an anatomic, anatomically correct skeleton in the front office? Like, I, I don't, I, I really don't understand the story behind that, but that was there. And uh, there was bats in the apartment and stuff. I tried to get a close picture of that one. I wrote this book about it, though. I wrote this book called Dead End Job, and it's about the, the tragic story of an artist who never leaves his soul crushing day job. Like, what if you were stuck there for eternity as, like, a kind of hell, you know? And, uh, you know, could you transcend that, or could you, uh, would it just suck you down into the abyss? And, your dreams would be super sad. There, there was a lot of guys there. There was actually this one guy named, uh, I'll just call him Jay, okay? And uh, Jay was on the set, uh, or was an extra in Shawshank Redemption. And so here's Jay, an extra in Shawshank Redemption. He, he remembers pushing Tom Hardy's car out of the, uh, uh, out of like the, the one, in one of the prison scenes because they didn't have gas in it or whatever. They just had to push it. And so there's Joe like, 
I see Joe picking up trash and I black him black amazingly. He's clearly drunk. Okay, it's like 10 o'clock in the morning. And I'm like, Joe, what are you listening to, man? And he's like, uh, movie, uh, movie soundtracks. I'm like, oh yeah? I'm like, why? He's like, well, I used to be an actor. And then I look at Joe and he's like, frail and balding and they drunk and then I'm there and I'm preparing my life and seeing my future projection of me. It was, it was dark, guys, it got dark. We cried, we laughed, but the, here's the book at the end and uh, I don't work there anymore, but you know, it might be fun. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. You can read some free at nickshermandesign.com. There's, there's me in heaven. And I got married and everything worked out. We're in the half later after now. Then I got hired at the Southern Ohio Museum. Right now, I'm building you guys up to the progression of, uh, you know, this is just me uh, post graduation, you know, and we're, then we're going to get into the arts and then we're going to get into death and resurrection. So remember that. Oh, yeah. The, the cream of the crop is going on right now. It's free to go to the museum, guys. If you haven't been to the museum, it's free. Go over there and see uh, all the artists in the 90 mile radius that have been collected. It, the whole thing is plastered full of art. Uh, it's a biannual event, but it's over there right now, so go check that out sometime. There's me at the front desk. There's Noah. Uh, <laughs> there's Noah, and uh, uh, his sounds, his sounds like when he's sitting. No, I don't. You make good sounds, is what I'm saying. You make good, pulsing <laughs> sounds. And you've got a good uh, hum and tone. But we, this, we did this thing called the trash pattern. Okay, part of me working at the museum was that we bring the cult to the museum. That was the thing. There's the connection. Okay? And uh, we, we had this thing called the trash pattern. And my buddies, who are uh, part of this band called Trash Pattern, everybody kept telling them, like, what a horrible name Trash Pattern is for a band. I mean, I mean it's pretty bad. But so we were like, Maybe we should try to have an event where we can explain to people what a trash pageant is. And uh, so that's what we did. We got everybody come in and decorate paper sashes, you know, and, and investigate art. And then everybody went down in the basement of the museum and just started doing mad arts and crafts. Like they were making masks and uh, doing paper collages. There's, there's uh, Evan sweating behind the drums. I mean, it was like art and sweat and the cults, you know? There's me. That was the general mood of the event right there. Uh, unfortunately, no one wins a trash pageant. That's what people didn't understand. No one won the trash pageant. Contestants don't win. It's just a secretly a ploy by the chicken man, who's this guy. Uh, it's secretly a ploy by the chicken man to destroy beauty. All right? And uh, they, they didn't let him, though. They, they tried to stop him. They tried to stop them, and, and uh, by the power of friendship and art making, they were able to save beauty. Then I quit at the museum. It was about three years, and uh, you know the funds ran out. It was a good, it was a good separation, uh, and you know this is what I do now. I, I hang out at home uh, with with my desk there, and uh, this is my setup. So I'll tell you guys the three components of my artistic life now, and uh, just uh, you know a few things about them. I like to write. Uh, I get up in the morning. I have my my spiritual practice. I start the writing after that, uh, and just I don't know normally if I'm if I'm generating uh, words. I'll go between a thousand and two thousand words in the morning. Uh, I'll tell you guys how to write a book. Okay, is anybody interested in writing? Maybe one thing. Or all you like to write. Uh, but, okay, how to write a book. It's pretty simple. You sit down, all right? That's, that's a harder step than you think because in The War of Art, Stephen Pressfield talks about this. Definitely get that book, War of Art. Uh, he talks about how it's not the sitting, it's not the writing that's hard, it's the sitting down and writing. Because you have every other excuse not to do that. You know, you have a real life and a real uh, real responsibility and, and pain and uh, and suffering and all that. And then you want to write, too, on top of that with something that probably won't work out. And, you know, you've got to justify that in your head, you know, that you want to be an artist, you want to make something of yourself. So 
That's, that's a big battle. It's just sitting down to write it. When you do sit down, if you write about 2,000 words, and then on step three, if you do that for 30 days, guess what? That's 60,000 words. That equals a novel, okay? Roughly speaking. Then you take, I don't know, you'll probably do 10 to 15 drafts. But, you know, I thought like the process of writing was like a two year journey of writing a book. But you can bang it out in like, I don't know, five months to a year if you're really on it, you have more time, you can do it in five months or less, you know? But I uh, just want to kind of proofread, you want to make sure the structure is good. But you have, in principle, what I'm saying is you have that 60,000 words in a month. Okay, there's your book. Something to think about. If you got, if you got that in the back of your head, percolate. The key to self-publishing. Anybody ever done? No? Okay. Uh, sign in with your Amazon login right here, Amazon KDP. Just go to Amazon KDP, that's Kindle Self-Publishing. And the cool thing about Amazon KDP is that uh, they take about 30%, you take 70%, and uh, plus, you know, minus your, uh, the actual physical cost of printing the book. But it's no cost up, it's no cost to you to have the book printed. You can have a book, you know? And that's pretty cool, that's a good opportunity. It's good leverage. There you go, you, got, you sign in, you add your Kindle book or, or your paperback, and there's also an audiobook option too, I don't know why that's not up there, but. You upload right there at the top left, dog. You upload your paper manuscript. You can take that 60,000 words you wrote in a Word document, just upload it. Then you upload your cover file. If you're not a graphic designer, you don't have art, uh, we can talk afterwards. Or or you can uh, use the cover template maker. It's real simple. You put your name and the title in there and the description. You review your book. You hit approve. You'll select a price. Uh, that's an option. That's a real publishing option. Then you'll be self-published, you know? If, if, I'll, I'll get off the writing girl this next one. <laughs> This is a one super hack though, is I go to Chris Fox, chrisfoxwrites.com. If you sign up for his email list, you'll get that book for free, about 5,000 words per hour. And uh, that's a game changer. If you're like trying to generate content, that's a real game changer, just those 10 chapters. I mean, you'll be, you'll be, uh, you'll be quantifying how quickly you can get a book done and you'll be racing to get a book done. It's pretty cool. Okay, design. Design is not art. Did, you know who said that? Matt Cram. Does anybody know Matt Cram? <laughs> All right, Matt Cram. He's a he's a design professor here. First time he said that, I was like, Matt, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Then I started to think about it and started to feel real life uh, scenarios where this actually applies. And I'll show you how it applies. There's a designer, and then there's a hip entrepreneur. Okay. And the designer's like, things I like. And then she's like, things I like. And then the designer's like, well, I went to art school. And then the other then the other person's like, well, I'm paying for this. Okay, so you have two people are butting heads over your design. Both get mad. Then someone's like, wait, what if you work together to serve an audience? Okay, so instead of thinking of design as fine art in your vision, you know, your vision, uh, you can think of it as you're both you're both trying to approach the situation as a service. You're trying to reach some other people and communicate, right? Um, that that changes the whole situation because then you're not fighting for your vision so much and you have the advantage. You might say like, oh, well, then I don't get to make something that's cool. I know what I'm talking about. I'm a designer. I want to make something that's cool that the client doesn't know what they're talking about. Well, you can use that as leverage. You can say, hey, look, I think this is who the audience is. I'm not interested in just getting my opinion Right, okay? I actually want to reach this audience, and you want to reach them too because you'll sell more, right? So that's how you negotiate, all right? You can work together to serve an audience, and that makes a better design, objectively. Uh, it will make you think more about how do I market this, how do I sell this, uh, and um, yeah. This is what I do right now. These uh, guys called uh, GRG Graduation Rate and Graphic Services. Like I said, you saw my desk, I sit at the desk, they, they send me designs over email, and I just start working on the designs in the morning after the writing, you know? Take lunch with Heather, then I'm gonna work on some more designs afterwards. Uh, that's, that's the grind right now. Anything else I do, I try to fit in around that, you know, maybe in the mornings or evenings. Um, 
but our Instagram page is GRG Let's Grow Together. There's a couple of, uh, there's some windows. Here's an example of something we print and apply. In, uh, in what, wait, Portsmouth West on the west side, there's like the front of their school. They just wanted some graphics for their windows. Stock that up real quick. Printed it this, uh, in this spot in Indiana they have a relationship with, and there you go. Married artists. This is component number three of my daily life, and then we get to death. Death. Uh, me and Heather do art together, okay? And uh, here's an example of some of the art we do. Ports of Crowd. It's on uh, 2nd Street, right there on Wits Cap, Wits Ice Cream, all right, right there on the side. And um, there's a little Instagram mural that we put up. There was a, that was one of the earlier ones we did together. And we did we also did Fred's Pizza. You guys go to Portsmouth Fred's Pizza. They wanted a big pizza on the wall, and we just kind of lined it out and painted it. And uh, it was cool. We also put a pea towel against this like wooden backdrop. That was right when the pandemic hit. Like well, maybe a couple weeks after that, they had called us because they were remodeling and wanted to see if we wanted to come in and paint some uh, paint some pizzas. All right. Pizza's good in Trent, I like the pizza in Trent. Pat's Cafe. This is at the end of Second Street, across from uh, the Ports Brewery. There we were just, um, you know, we were just doing this veteran mural. And so one cool thing about this mural is like, in Vietnam it was kind of guerrilla warfare, like, you know, and the, in some ways the army was decentralized and they didn't keep clean uniforms, so they'd write in Sharpie on their helmets and, you know, I don't know, put a, uh, you know, they put an ace of spades in their helmets, they put cigarettes and bug juice in there and stuff. And uh, so that, it gave it this really gritty aesthetic, you know, and uh, it'd just be like punk people drawing on jean jackets and stuff, like that's what they were doing. And uh, they, all kinds of fun uh, sayings, like the, they'd have the Grim Reaper scribbled on there and then like, miss me, or, uh, or uh, I don't know, just, just the, their tallies of how many days they've been there, or, uh, live fast, where they put Rat Fink on there. You guys know who Rat Fink is, the decrepit Mickey Mouse character? He's like Mickey Mouse, but he's like metal, you know? Uh, if you want to see a recap of Heather and I doing this whole thing, go to makesuredesign.com and you can watch the time lapse, you can watch uh, just us talk about it. You can also find us on Instagram, at Married Artists. Heather runs that page and just, just you know, post stuff as we do it. But the real question is why?